1951, an article in Time magazine read, The most startling fact about the younger generation is its silence. With some rare exceptions, youth is nowhere near the rostrum. By comparison with the flaming youth of their fathers and mothers, today's younger generation is still small flame. It does not issue manifestos or carry posters. It has been called the silent generation. The silent generation is generally accepted to be the years between 1925 and 1945. Children of this generation experienced an especially uncertain life. They endured the constant worries about food and shelter from the Great Depression and effects from the Dust Bowl. They grew up when organized crime was rampant and Jimmy Hoffa was pushing for fair employment. They felt the trauma of lost fathers, brothers, and uncles in World War II. They learned about atomic bombs, and they saw the paranoia of McCarthyism. This was the generation of waste not, want not, and children are to be seen, not heard. Because of so much uncertainty, the silent generation were known to be frugal with their money and resources. They were considered respectful of authority and dependable at work, loyal in relationships and beliefs, simple, determined, and patriotic. Walter Leroy Moody Jr., better known as Roy, was born March 24, 1935 in Rex, Georgia, in the middle of the silent generation. His father and grandfather were auto mechanics. He was the oldest of three children and the family lived in a farming community. His mother described him as a bookworm who loved airplanes and writing short stories. Like his father and grandfather, he was mechanically inclined. He built a lot of model airplanes as a child and continued tinkering with engines and various machinery as he got older. His brother Bobby said, Roy was always a loner. I wouldn't have any idea who to tell you who might know him well. Roy graduated from high school in 1953 after which he enlisted in the Army. He served as a specialist trained to analyze an enemy's transmission via radio, teletype, or Morse code. Three years into the service, he entered the Army Reserves. He then served two years in the Air Force. Upon leaving the military, Roy studied chemistry and physics at Mercer University. He majored in pre-med and he wanted to go into medicine, possibly neurology, but he had bad grades, so he quit. He then attended John Marshall Law School for one year. I couldn't find out when, but presumably sometime in the 1960s, Roy married Hazel. I believe they had several children. I'm unsure why, but he had a psychological evaluation in 1967. That evaluation showed that he harbored violent thoughts. The doctor who evaluated him said he was constantly afraid that Roy may end up committing some sort of destruction towards society. He was diagnosed with ambulatory schizophrenia. He knew right from wrong, but couldn't seem to keep from impulsively going ahead and doing whatever he thought of. May 7, 1972, Roy's wife Hazel found a package in their kitchen. She was curious, and as she opened the box, a pipe bomb exploded. It tore through her hand, thigh, and shoulder, and scrap metal was sent into her eye. Her injuries required six surgeries. The box which exploded had a mailing address along with the name of an automobile dealer who repossessed Roy's car. Charged with manufacturing and possessing a pipe bomb, Roy testified at his trial. His defense was that a man named Gene Wallace had secretly planted the bomb in the Moody's home. The Gene Wallace defense didn't work. October 19, 1972, he was acquitted of the charge of manufacturing the pipe bomb, but he was found guilty of possessing it. He was sentenced to five years in the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, but served only three. In a shocking turn of events for absolutely no one, Hazel divorced Roy. It's said, but not confirmed, that it had something to do with a bomb exploding in her face. We may never know, though. After he was released from prison, Roy wanted to go back to law school, 
but looking into it, he learned that his felony conviction would disqualify him from practicing law in Georgia. This began his obsession with the unfairness of that 1972 conviction. Roy supported himself through a mail-order business called Associated Writers Guild of America. Inexperienced, aspiring writers and editors were his ideal, targeted customers. The business, pardon me, the Guild, said that they could train people to become professional proofreaders and make more than $30,000 per year. That would be over $165,000 today for proofreading. Or the amateur author could learn the secrets to write and sell poetry or stories for $1,000 each, over $5,000 today. All it took was paying for a course to learn the tricks of the trade. But whatever the cost, it was definitely worth it for the ability to make that kind of cash as a brand new writer. Then, just to get their name out there for another fee, authors could have their work published in a book called Authors to Watch. Yeah, it was a scam. Roy made as much as $3,700 a day from that scheme, $20,000 today, in a single day. The Better Business Bureau had complaints from the 48 contiguous states, and the U.S. Postal Service accused Roy and the Associated Writers Guild of America of running a mail-order scam. One postal inspector said, Every pretense and representation he used in order to obtain money from persons interested in employment is false. The USPS recommended that he be prosecuted for mail fraud, but other federal authorities disagreed, asserting that there were not enough people who had completed the correspondence course to prove that it was not a legitimate employment opportunity. Frustrated, the postal inspectors had a different plan. They were able to win an internal administrative ruling which allowed them to block mail addressed to the guild. If they got no mail, their mail order business was essentially shut down without shutting it down. Roy started a boating equipment company. He took out life insurance policies on three of his employees, which totaled $2.2 million, $6.5 million today. Roy and his well-insured employees went out in the Gulf of Mexico. Roy had them go diving to take underwater photographs of a propulsion device that he planned to sell. From what I could gather, Roy abandoned them in the water. One of the men made a statement that he was trying frantically to climb the ladder when Roy stomped on his hand. They lived and he was charged with attempted murder, but the trial ended with a hung jury and the case was not retried, not to be outdone, Roy then filed a civil lawsuit against the men he abandoned in the Gulf of Mexico for false arrest and malicious prosecution. The lawsuit was dismissed. Sometime around this attempted murder fiasco, Roy met his new gal, Susan. She was young, about 20 years old when they got together. Roy was approaching 50. Roy was litigious. He sued his brother and sister over their mother's will. He sued the city over zoning issues, legal fees, and for the sale of an airplane. It was said that to some he was supremely intelligent, and to some he was mentally ill. I'm not sure why there needs to be a separation there. One can definitely be both intelligent and mentally ill. One of his many criminal defense attorneys said, It's one thing not to get along well in society. It's another thing to have this pattern of conduct. Most people know him as a man who has a history of serious psychiatric illness. Now, when I hear psychiatric illness in this context, I think the reference is to something really crazy, like the image you get when you picture Charles Manson. I don't buy it. Not at all. In 1985, Roy began designing a plan to have his 1972 pipe bomb conviction overturned. He bribed an acquaintance that he just met Julie, to substantiate his claim that someone else did it. Julie was a 34-year-old single mom who had been wheelchair-bound since she was 14 years old. She was destitute and perfect for the plan. Roy gave Julie a script to memorize which would point the finger at this really terrible guy named Gene Wallace. Roy paid her in monthly installments of $100 for her to testify that she knew Gene Wallace and that she saw him place the bomb in the Moody home in 1972. 
She was to say that she was afraid of Gene Wallace, and that he would hurt her if she implicated him. But her conscience just couldn't take it anymore. She had to speak up. She had to clear Roy's good name. In September 1986, Roy filed a Writ of Error Quorum Nobis. A writ is just a written command. Quorum Nobis is Latin for before us. So essentially, a written declaration of error before us. Or even easier, it's basically an appeal. The concept is that the trial would have turned out differently, or it may not have gone to trial at all, if the new information being presented today had been known back then. The writ slash appeal claimed two things. One, that Roy had new evidence that took the blame away from him, and two, that he had ineffective counsel. In support of the appeal, Roy filed a 71-paragraph affidavit to support the petition. I have no idea how long 71 paragraphs would be, or why it would be categorized by paragraphs, but my guess is it was around 20 pages, which isn't nearly as dramatic sounding. Court documents can get pretty wordy pretty quickly. Of the 71 paragraphs in his appeal, 40 of them describe detailed conversations between Roy and his own attorney. The other 31 paragraphs, the big winner in his appeal, was the testimony from Roy's new friend, Julie. In January 1988, Roy offered to pay Joanne if she, too, would confirm the Jean Wallace story. She agreed, and he got to work coaching her as well. This was the story they memorized as written in court documents. In May of 1972, Julie and her mother, Joanne, traveled to Atlanta from their Wisconsin home. While staying at a motel, Julie, who was a teenager at the time and already paralyzed from the waist down, met a man named Jean Wallace. Jean asked Julie for a date and, after pleading with her mother, Julie was allowed to go. Jean Wallace drove to Macon. He proceeded to a house, retrieved a package from his car, and placed the package inside the house. While driving away, he exclaimed, I forgot, he doesn't have a phone, and doubled back to the house. As they pulled in front of the house, emergency vehicles were already lining the street, and it looked as though some sort of explosion or fire had occurred inside the house. When Julie questioned Jean Wallace about the package, he beat her. He took her back to the motel, and she never saw him again. However, the memories of that day haunted her. She had frightful dreams for years. Finally, after 14 years, she could stand it no longer. Julie, who lived in Atlanta in 1986, decided to go to the Macon Library to discover whether anyone had been injured in the explosion. Aided by helpful librarians, Julie and her mother learned of the fate of Hazel Moody and eventually got in touch with Roy Moody, who at last had someone to corroborate his Gene Wallace defense. Roy was dramatic in his coaching of Julie. He sent her to the library and told her to ask a librarian for help with the microfilm equipment so he could research this very specific situation from 14 years earlier in 1972. At some point, during her very conspicuous research, Julie told a librarian that she left her pen somewhere and asked for help finding it. She said that her initials, J.L.W., were on the pen. Julie's mother was supposed to have been part of this whole library, microfilm research, lost pen scenario, but she was busy. No problem. Roy's wife, Susan, wore a wig and drove Julie to the library instead. One month later, on February 1st, 1988, the United States District Court for the Middle District of Georgia held a hearing on Roy's appeal. Julie testified just as she'd been coached. I can't help but picture Roy mouthing the memorized words along with her. Her mother, Joanne, also testified, but she struggled with the lines she memorized. Then, to corroborate the story, Roy called the librarian to the stand to testify that she did see Julie and Susan pretending to be Joanne. Normally, she may not have remembered them specifically, but thank goodness she somehow remembered a woman in a wheelchair who needed help with microfilm, who lost her pen with her initials on it, who was with a woman in a wig. Roy was furious about Joanne's awful acting job. He chewed her out and told her that she lost the case for him. 
but he did pay her for the poor performance while they both stood on the courthouse steps. Roy's petition to overturn the 1972 pipe bomb explosion was denied February 8, 1988. August 21, 1989, just after noon, a package was delivered to the Atlanta Regional Office of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. It had been sent priority mail and had a return address of a law office in Atlanta. When an NAACP director opened the box, Witnesses saw two sparks, then heard two loud pops, after which a cylinder inside the box released a caustic smoke, filling the office with tear gas. Eight people were injured, including a 12-year-old and a four-month-old baby. The gas spread from the NAACP office to the surrounding offices in the two-story building via the air conditioning ducts. A typed death threat accompanied the tear gas bomb. In the following days, various news outlets throughout the eastern United States received copies of the typed letter, which complained about the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals and their callous disregard for justice. The letter contained a declaration of war and threatened nerve gas attacks in densely populated cities. All the letters used a 25-cent Yosemite stamp, and the letters were written on the same typewriter used for the tear gas bomb. Nominated by President Jimmy Carter, Judge Robert Vance served on the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit, a.k.a. Alabama. On December 16, 1989, Judge Vance received a package at his home with a return address for a colleague of his, Judge Lewis Morgan. Just over a week before Christmas, he likely thought it was a gift. He brought the package into his kitchen and set it on the table to open it. As he untied the string on the box and opened the brown paper packaging, a pipe bomb exploded, killing 58-year-old Judge Robert Vance instantly. One of the nails used as shrapnel pierced the liver of his wife, Helen, seriously injuring her, but she did live. One of the stories that has been passed along over the years is that Roy Moody targeted Judge Vance because he was one of the appellate judges who denied his appeal to overturn the 1972 bomb conviction. That's not true, though. The denied petition was affirmed by three judges on the 11th Circuit Court, but Judge Vance was not one of them. It is likely that he simply chose someone on the panel of judges, and Judge Vance was the unlucky one. Other than through the general appellate process, they were complete strangers. Robert Robbie Robinson was a civil rights activist, a lawyer, and a city councilman in Savannah, Georgia. When Robbie was 16 years old, in 1963, he was one of 12 black students who enrolled in Savannah High School, which had previously been an all-white school. His sister said, He was one of the ones that volunteered to go to Savannah High. He suffered a lot of abuse. That year, as a young teen, Robbie joined with the NAACP who had organized a sit-in to desegregate a beach near Savannah. They called it a wade-in, a sit-in on the beach. All of the demonstrators were arrested, but the charges were dropped, and the wade-in worked. The beach was desegregated. Robbie graduated magna cum laude from Savannah State and received a scholarship to Lumpkin Law School at the University of Georgia. He was one of three black students to attend the law school and went on to earn his law degree. He served as legal counsel for the local NAACP. In 1982, Robbie was elected as a city councilman, which gave him the ability to make a difference in the newly desegregated community. Former Savannah Mayor Otis Johnson said, There was a lot of work still to be done in terms of what we would call an equity agenda bringing the black community up to par with the other neighborhoods in the community. On December 18, 1989, two days after Judge Vance was killed by a pipe bomb, a package was delivered to Robbie's law offices. Robbie found the package on his desk and, again, this was just before Christmas, so no one thought twice about the package. When opened, a pipe bomb exploded and fatally wounded him. Robert Robinson died three hours later. 
another package was mailed to a courthouse in Atlanta. A security guard discovered it during a routine x-ray and it was safely defused. The president of the NAACP in Jacksonville, Florida also received a package. Incredibly, she had been warned by a friend just before she got the ominous box and avoided what was likely certain death. Inside the box, along with a pipe bomb, the sender took credit for the NAACP tear gas attacks four months earlier. The letter said that they were hunting NAACP officers. Around 30 letters were sent to federal judges, civil rights groups, and news organizations. The writer of the threatening letters signed them as Americans for a Competent Federal Judicial System. A portion of the letter said, Americans for a competent federal judicial system assassinated Judge Robert S. Vance and attorney Robert Robinson in reprisal for the atrocities inflicted upon Julie Love. Two more prominent members of the NAACP shall be assassinated using a more sophisticated means as part of the same reprisal. Any portion directed toward judges, the letter said, if you want to live, you shall make protecting civil rights of the innocent your highest obligation, and you shall fulfill that obligation. Five million dollars were spent on bodyguards to protect Judge Vance's wife and federal judges, and to make upgrades to courthouse video and x-ray equipment. The frenzy to search for clues was palpable, but it was a chemist from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms who made the crucial link. The ATF chemist remembered a bomb which had been found by a woman in Georgia many years earlier, in 1972, at Roy Moody's house. Court documents in the case against Roy said, Two warrants were issued which authorized the search of Moody's home and his truck. During the search, agents saw, in plain view, documents indicating that Moody was involved in a plan to obstruct justice. The warrants were issued based on the affidavit of a special agent from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, the ATF, who had 23 years of experience in bomb investigation. The affidavit was 43 pages, which explained the similarities in the recent bombings and the 1972 bombing. Aided by a computer, the ATF agent searched the description of 10,000 previous bombing incidents only one matched the description of the 1989 bombs, the one Moody was convicted of possessing in 1972. In February 1990, Roy found out that a federal grand jury had been called to investigate his connection with Julie and Joanne. After he thoroughly coached them on their story again, he burned the instructions he wrote for them and told them they could never admit the perjury. He paid them $400 to continue the lies about the Jean Wallace story. But the mom and daughter told him they were worried and seemed uneasy about lying again. Roy warned them that if they told the truth, they'd be in mortal danger. The Miami Mafia would send them through death's door to push up the daisies on the graveyard shift. But Roy didn't know that they were already working with the investigators and his conversations were caught on hidden camera, both audio and video. In March, he mailed a letter to President Bush. He promised to reveal who may have been the pipe bomber if he would call off the FBI raid. He got no response. July 10, 1990, another warrant was issued to search Roy's home. The search involved the seizure of videotapes, audio tapes, answering machine, journals, notebooks, writings, and computer disks dealing with the mail bombing and obstruction of justice activities. Agents had been conducting electronic surveillance of Roy's home. Between all of the audio and video recordings, they believed that they'd uncover the identity of any co-conspirators. They further heard that Roy kept a journal, and it was suspected that the scripts he wrote for Julie and Joanne might be written in it. Roy maintained his innocence, but he loved the notoriety around all of these FBI searches. He began planning to sell t-shirts as a fundraiser to make a movie about his life. The movie was to be called Above the Law, all about Roy and the injustice heaped upon him by FBI agents. When asked who would play the main character, Walter Leroy Moody Jr., Roy said, I don't know. Clark Gable is dead. Sadly, the t-shirts in the movie were never made.
Roy and his wife Susan were arrested July 13, 1990. She was released on $250,000 bail within a week and later testified against Roy for a plea agreement. They had been together for about eight years, but they'd only been married for one year when Susan filed for divorce. I wonder if they married so they wouldn't have to testify against each other, but that plea deal was too good to pass up for Susan. August 17, 1990, another search warrant authorized the seizure of a letter folding machine and representative samples of any letters, papers, or other documents which appeared to have been mechanically folded. The threatening letters sent with the mail bombs appeared to have been folded similarly to letters used in Moody's business, the Associated Writers Guild of America. Ah, the scam from back in the day bit him right in the rear. What an idiot! Oh, what a loser! The prosecutor in the federal case said that the bombings of attorney Robbie Robinson and the NAACP were meant to deflect attention away from Roy, to make the crimes point in the direction of a race war. But it wasn't race-related at all. His hatred was toward the justice system that he became obsessed with. His killing of Judge Vance and his bombing of the 11th Circuit were motivated by the court's refusal to expunge. His killing of Judge Vance and his bombing of the 11th Circuit were motivated by the court's refusal to expunge Roy's conviction for the 1972 explosion in his home. It did not matter to him that Judge Vance was not a part of that decision. Roy was indicted for the bombings and related crimes in November 1990. He was even lucky enough to get four counts of obstruction of justice for his role in hiring Julie and Joanne to lie about Jean Wallace. As the date for trial was slowly approaching, Roy filed a motion in July 1994, requesting that he be allowed to proceed pro se. He wanted to represent himself because he didn't trust lawyers. August 2nd, a hearing took place to review the pro se motion. It was during that hearing that an investigator for the Alabama Attorney General's office explained Roy's litigious history. The investigator testified that since 1972, Roy had been a party in 63 legal proceedings, both civil and criminal. Roy had 47 attorneys that he hired or who were appointed, and he said that nearly all of them were ineffective in their representation. In 35 of the legal proceedings, Roy was pro se. The next several months became a dance, where Roy would say he wanted to represent himself, then when everyone showed up to the next court hearing, he'd say he actually found an attorney who wanted to represent him, so the hearing would be rescheduled. That extended the trial for 16 months. They passed the January 30th trial date, then a few more trial dates. May 7th, 1996, they met again to discuss Roy's legal representation and to set the trial for October 7th. Roy said he wanted to do it pro se. Keep in mind that he'd been arrested in 1990, so this is six years later. So October 7th, people showed up for a trial. Citizens in Alabama did their civic duty and showed up for jury selection. After making careful decisions about the jury, Roy presented the court with a motion for continuance, stating that he had an attorney who wanted to represent him. The court was pissed. October 10th, Roy told the trial court that he did have legal counsel and that the court should refer to him only for all further communication. He objected to this case being prosecuted without my attorney, Mr. David L. Lewis, being present to protect my rights. At the end of the day, an Alabama attorney appeared on behalf of Lewis, requesting that Lewis be admitted to practice pro hac vice. Pro hac vice is Latin, meaning for this one particular occasion. Lewis, the attorney Roy wanted, was only licensed in New York, not Alabama, so he needed permission to practice law in Alabama for this one particular occasion. Lewis, the attorney Roy wanted, was only licensed in New York, not Alabama, so he needed permission to practice law in Alabama for this one particular occasion, or pro hac vice. It was also asked that the trial be postponed an additional 12 to 18 months to allow for the attorney to prepare. The prosecutor was heated. According to the transcript, he said, 
Well, Judge, as I said, what's new? This is probably the fourth or fifth occasion that Mr. Moody has waited until the last second to say, oh, I've got somebody to represent me. And is he representing him pro bono? Is he asking to be appointed? Has he been retained? We don't know his status. Besides that, is he qualified to come in and practice in this court? That would be a question. And we certainly oppose any continuance for any lawyer. This has been a typical and repeated performance. And I ask the court to take judicial notice of the filing of Mr. Moody's litigation history with us, where he went through 40 some odd attorneys. And his tactic has been repeatedly in his federal proceedings and in this proceeding to wait until the last minute to say, oh, I've got a lawyer that wants to represent me, continue this case. And it's been over and over and over and over again. This matter should not be continued. If Mr. Lewis wants to bring himself down here from New York and qualify himself with this court and tell us what status he's going to represent Mr. Moody in, bring him on. Let's get it going. But let's start it Tuesday morning like we are supposed to. Let's get this jury struck and let's go on. If we do it at Mr. Moody's schedule, it will be the day after forever. The judge did deny the continuance of the trial. The next day, the same thing happened again. The Alabama attorney said that an attorney from Georgia was interested in representing Roy. He asked if that attorney could practice pro hoc vice and asked to extend the trial. That was also denied. Jury selection continued, but not without interference by Roy. When the state challenged a potential juror, Roy refused to do anything without both of the out-of-state attorneys. The judge denied the attorneys again. Trial was set for October 15th. So, October 15th, they show up for trial. The Georgia attorney is there with Roy, asking to be his counsel pro hac vice, and also asking to postpone the trial for some long chunk of time in order for him to prepare the defense. The judge denied it, again. After all that, Roy ended up representing himself. And by representing himself, what I really mean is he refused to participate in any part of the trial other than his own testimony for four days. He didn't make an opening statement. He didn't cross-examine any witnesses. He didn't present any witnesses other than himself. He didn't object to anything, and he didn't make a closing statement. Susan testified that Roy sealed off a bedroom and only used it to build pipe bombs. She explained her part in gathering all of the supplies for him for the bombs and for the packages used to send them. She bought the mailing labels, stamps, cardboard boxes, aluminum pie pans, goose pattern paper towels, flashlight bulbs, C-cell batteries, black latex paint, nails, string, brown wrapping paper, aluminum clothesline wire, rubber bands, and tape. After he completed his work, he thoroughly cleaned and remodeled the bedroom to erase any trace of what happened in that room. A witness testified that on December 2, 1989, Roy purchased four pounds of Hercules Red Dot brand smokeless gunpowder and primer material from a gun shop in Georgia. Forensic analysis showed that they were the same as what was used in the bombings. Julie testified that the whole Gene Wallace story was fabricated by Roy, who coached her and paid her for her performance. Her mother testified of the same. As the star witnesses were admitted perjurers, the prosecution played the audio and video evidence that proved their story. Furthermore, it was proven that Julie was in the hospital the whole month of May when the bombing happened. So the Gene Wallace dating story could not have happened. I guess Roy forgot to find out what she was actually doing back then before he hired her to lie for him. When Roy took the stand, he testified that he did lie about the Gene Wallace story. But his new story was that the pipe bomb in 1972 that seriously injured his ex-wife wasn't actually a bomb. It was just a homemade paint spray gun. It just sort of exploded. And the room in his house that was closed off that Susan testified about? That wasn't to build pipe bombs. He was just experimenting with producing cold fusion. 
Walter Leroy Moody Jr. was convicted on 71 separate charges. He was sentenced to seven federal life terms. For Judge Vance's murder, he was sentenced to death. Court documents said, The murder was made capital because it was committed by means of explosives or explosion and because Judge Vance was a federal public official and the murder was related to his official position. Roy appealed. It was denied. Roy was on death row at Holman Correctional Facility in Alabama starting in February 1997 until his execution by lethal injection on April 19, 2018. His last meal was Philly cheesesteaks, Dr. Pepper, and M&Ms. He had no last words and gave no last response. He was 83 years old. Many accounts of Roy Moody's life attribute his acts to him feeling like a victim of conspiracy. I don't even remotely subscribe to that. I don't even understand that conclusion. I think Roy liked the feeling of power. That first pipe bomb in 1972, the event that started it all, It had been addressed to the auto dealer who repossessed his car. Oddly, that detail is glossed over in the recounting of Roy's actions. Cars get repoed when you don't make payments. So his car is taken from him due to his own action or lack of action. And his answer to that was to have nails explode into the guy who was just doing his job. His wife opened it instead. He got caught and arrested and couldn't become an attorney. From that point on, he always seemed to seek out ways to gain back his power, and all it did was make him an unlikable guy who did really terrible things. Roy was born in the middle of the silent generation. Time Magazine said that generation does not issue manifestos, that they were a still, small flame. The silent generation is said to have respected authorities, They were dependable and frugal and patriotic. So what happened here? The same thing that happens when you meet a narcissistic Pisces who couldn't care less about the people around them. Or when a fortune cookie says that you're appreciated at work right after you got fired. An entire generation filled with individuals cannot ever be molded into a cute stereotype. Sometimes you get a reliable, respectable, still small flame. Sometimes you get a Roy.